My name is Marcus Guino, and I have the great honor of being the president of Global Santa Fe. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, the Judge Case uh, Lecture on International Law recognizes and honors our, our former president, uh, Chuck Case, uh, for his distinguished service to the legal profession and, of course, to Global Santa Fe as well. Uh, the purpose of these lectures is to have distinguished leaders in international law uh, speak about the basic legal rights of citizens around the globe, uh, something that is more important than ever, as I think all of you know. Uh, we are greatly honored today to have as our first lecturer, Professor Harold Coe, uh, one of the country's leading experts on public and private international law, national security uh, law, and human rights. Um, but uh, that will all come after the lunch. So I have the honor now to invite you all to the buffet. My name is David Killian, and I'm the vice president of the board of Global Santa Fe. And I'm delighted to be here with all of you today and with my good friend Harold Coe. And I just want to say a few words of introduction. Everybody knows what Harold has done, and I want to talk a little bit about who he is. I first met Harold Coe 24 years ago in 1998 when he was nominated to be Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And I was assigned to be his Sherpa for the, his confirmation process. We quickly became friends. Once Harold was easily confirmed, I was responsible for managing his bureau's relations with the House and the Senate. This was a cinch, as Harold and I were much of the like minds. We both liked to push the policy envelope, think outside the box, and get things done. Many people know that Harold is a great, gifted legal scholar and a premier practitioner of international law. Fewer know what a skilled policymaker he is. Harold understands how Washington really works in a way that few I ever met in Washington do. Harold understands that although Washington appears to be a hierarchy that operates on zero-sum principles, in reality, in DC, power is diffuse, and the game is best played as positive sum. So Harold treated everyone he encountered exactly the same. He was as kind, inquisitive, transactional, transparent, with personal assistance, legislative assistance, and drivers, as he was with first ladies, senators, secretaries of state, and presidents. It worked. In those days, I, I uh, rarely saw Harold lose any bureaucratic battle in Foggy Bottom, and I never saw him fail in advancing legislative priorities on Capitol Hill or killing legislative threats. The only problem I ever had with Harold was his work ethic. <laughs> Boy, was it over the top. Um, this is hardly surprising considering that Harold comes from the Korean American equivalent of the Kennedy clan. There were times when we were really afraid that the wheels would come off if Harold didn't slow down. Luckily, I had a secret weapon. I had a wild card to play when things got critical and we needed him to take a break. The weapon was baseball. <laughs> Harold and I loved baseball. I didn't think, um, Harold knows, I don't think Harold knows this, but any time that uh, Harold's personal assistant, Linda, got worried about his hours and his stress level, she would simply pick up the phone and call me and tell me to take Harold to a baseball game. I happily obliged, and uh, there were no teams in D.C. at the time, so we would drive up to Baltimore. Although Harold is a dedicated Red Sox fan, we both enjoyed rooting for, for the Oriole Harold Baines. I, because Harold Baines was a pure hitter, and Harold, because there have never been any great baseball players named Harold. <laughs> several, several years ago, Harold was the graduation speaker at Duke Law School. That year's graduating class was the most diverse in Duke's history, um, containing many, like Harold, from immigrant families. Harold acknowledged for these students how difficult it is to break into the old boy network, but he underscored how important it is to per persevere 
by invoking legendary baseball player Jackie Robinson, who broke baseball's color barrier. Harold told the students that Robinson once said that when everybody gets to play, the game is much better. That's the story of Harold's wonderful life. He's made every game he's ever played in much better. And I give you Harold Coe, the inaugural Chuck Case Lecturer on International Law. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's very touching to be here. Uh, let me point out that besides Harold Baines, uh, Harold uh, Pee Wee Reese was also named <laughs> Harold, and he preferred the name Pee Wee. Um, there was also a judge in Texas named Barefoot Sanders. You may remember him, a friend of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And I asked his daughter, uh, is Barefoot his uh, nickname? And she said, no, it's his middle name. And I said, why does he call himself Barefoot? And she says, because he hates his real name, which is Harold. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walked into that one. Um, anyway, it, it's just fantastic to be here um, in Santa Fe and the Albuquerque area, the home of George O'Keefe, Breaking Bad, <laughs> the Santa Fe Opera, the Santa Fe Institute. And I know it's called Land of Enchantment, but I've been learning that it really should be called Land of Ambassadors <laughs> because of Ambassador Esquinas, the head of the uh, Global Santa Fe. Uh, my dear friend, uh, David Killian and Kristen Killian, who uh, in addition to having gotten me confirmed the first time, hosted me at their home in Paris. and. Uh, you should have seen it, uh, when David was ambassador to UNESCO. And then uh, David Sheffer, who is here, um, who uh, I've known since we were freshmen in college, more than, uh, well, I won't say how long, <laughs> <laughs> but who I also now have learned, he, he was ambassador at large for war crimes, the first, and also now lives in the um, Santa Fe area. Uh, I should admit that uh, I was asked, uh, have you been here before? Uh, we did come for the Breaking Bad tour, uh, <laughs> where my, um, we went to the candy store and we got the blue meth, <laughs> and we went to uh, uh, the chicken st uh, store and the car wash and, and everything else. So um, having taken care of the necess necessary actions, I now return to the international law world. <laughs> <laughs> which I occupy. But it's uh, such a pleasure to honor Judge Chuck Case. Um, you know about him. Uh, he was a distinguished uh, bankruptcy judge for 19 years and uh, the winner of the International Insolvency Institute's Founders Award. Uh, he was in private practice at an outstanding firm in Phoenix, uh, and he has taught and trained and consulted on these rule of law issues in some 24 countries. And most fundamentally, he was the immediate past president of the Council of International Relations, now called Global Santa Fe. And I'm very honored to have the chance to um, uh, make this the first um, international law lecture in his honor. And I know that Chuck is interested in the rule of law question, um, which very much occupies our current president, Joe Biden, who entered the White House determined not just to reverse the excesses of the Trump administration, but more ambitiously to try to restore the post-war liberal order of international law and institutions. Uh, it's a big challenge. One way to put it is international law, thick or thin. Um, after uh, 1945, an ambitious vision of international law led by the UN, the Bretton Woods system, was created um, and uh, in which the multilateral system would play a values-driven multi-actor role in attacking emerging problems. But in recent times, we've seen, and I'll say more about this in a moment, um, emphasis on a kind of thinner approach to international law, less capable, less able to solve the problems that are uh, approaching us at a time of Ukraine, climate change, and uh, the global pandemic. 
So let me tell a story in four acts. It's uh, in, uh, both personal and global. And uh, it's driven by the maxim of that philosopher, Mike Tyson, who says, everyone has a plan until he gets punched in the face. Um, this was true of uh, Joe Biden. Um, so act one was the development of what I would call the Biden doctrine. Act two, executing the plan. Act three, challenges. And then act four, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, which we're still uh, addressing now. Now, uh, my last book, The Trump Administration and International Law, argued that Trump followed a three-prong approach. Disengage, black hole, which means um, not invoking rules of international law, just national interest, and no effort at leverage or a diplomatic strategy. And it was an extraordinarily disastrous policy for our international affairs. Among other things, you can imagine, one of his uh, platforms was to disengage from NATO. And if that had succeeded uh, and uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, where would we be now? Uh, Joe Biden came in um, following in the footsteps of Clinton and Obama. You could argue was also following in the footsteps of George H.W. Bush, a strategy called engage, translate, and leverage, which is when in doubt, engage with our allies around common values. When in doubt, if the law is not applicable to the current day, for example, there was no internet, obviously, in uh, the uh, 20th century, try to translate the rules of laws of war to cyber war. And third, try to leverage diplomacy, democracy, and development with other tools to get to stable and uh, legal outcomes. Uh, Biden himself has stated this really in terms of three principles. First, human rights at the center of US policy. Second, what you call the three Ds, diplomacy, development, and democracy. And third, what you could call the four Rs, reverse, re-engage, reconceptualize, and rebuild. Or as they call it, build back better, long-term structural change. Now, I know that this was his approach because it was the approach of the transition team. Um, a lot of my friends were on the transition team. They asked me to be on the transition team. Um, and they developed a 200-day plan. Um, by the way, B Biden's transition was probably the best planned in modern American history for the simple reason that we were in the pandemic. So Biden couldn't campaign and what he did, frankly, was in the morning, he would meet with his advisors and plan his transition, economic and foreign policy. In the afternoon, they'd take him to somewhere in the Delaware, Philadelphia area, and he'd do one event. And then at night, he would do Zoom calls uh, to raise money, um, extending until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, he's having the Zoom calls in, in California or Hawaii or something like that, which meant that unlike many presidents, he actually had an extraordinary time to prepare his transition. In fact, the only analogous period was when, right after 9-11, Dick Cheney famously went to an undisclosed location and planned the invasion of uh, Iraq. Uh, so we, we had a, a counter to that. Now, um, interestingly, many of the members of the Biden national security team are from my law school and are my former students, most famously Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, John Feiner, the deputy, Wally Adiamo, deputy secretary of the treasury, Beth Von Skok, who succeeded David Sheffer as um, war crimes ambassador, Jim O'Brien, who had been David's uh, deputy is now the ambassador for sanctions coordination. Caroline Crass, my former teaching assistant, uh, is now the um, general counsel of the Department of Defense. Gina Raimundo, also my former teaching assistant, is Secretary of Commerce, and Kate Heinzelman, general counsel of the CIA. So uh, these people had very much imbibed the engage, translate, and leverage idea. And what happened was, uh, around Christmas of 2020, 
um, they called me and they said, would you be willing to go into the administration for the first seven months? Because uh, we're not going to have a confirmed legal advisor. In fact, they still don't have a confirmed legal advisor 20 months in, incredibly. Um, and they said, but you know, you know the lay of the land and uh, we could get you in. Now, in, I've served in the government on and off since 1980. And in each of five decades, I've served in the Reagan, uh, Clinton, Obama, now Biden administration. And I thought it would be interesting to be at the start of administration, especially one that had such a good transition plan, uh, when, and which was facing such dire um, challenges. And I was aided in this by the fact that we could do it on Zoom. We, I didn't have to go to Washington. Um, I, participated in the government on calls from my house. I went to Washington every other week for three days, and then I would come home. Um, we, on classified material, they brought a laptop to my house, a highly classified laptop, which I used, um, as well as a red phone for classified calls. And then for classified uh, video, um, it turned out that if I went to the local FBI with a bag of bagels, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> and talked about the New England Patriots with the special agent in charge. Um, they would let me use their video conference room. And um, so I was able to serve in the administration uh, from January to October of 2021. Uh, now, at the end of that period, I went to Oxford, England, where I was a visiting professor for a year. It had been arranged for a long time, and I wasn't going to give that up. Um, but I thought that would be a good way to get the government uh, started. So um, it was an extraordinary time. I'm happy in question and answer to ask, answer questions you might have. One of the effects was that everybody was there at the White House, 100% of the people. They were tested for COVID three times a day, and they wore color-coded bracelets. But in the agencies, like the State Department, they had a 25% occupancy limit. And in fact, because it was measured by whether you swiped your card in, if somebody came in for an hour in the morning, and then toward the end of the day, they were approaching the 25%, they would tell people not to come in. Um, which meant that the White House uh, and the National Security Council began to assert extraordinary control over foreign policy, even more uh, than I've seen in the past. Now, I would say that the first 200 days was, you know, really like um, a football game where the team has a plan. And we just executed. Uh, Biden said, put human rights at the center. We ended the Muslim ban. We repealed the Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, transgender individuals served in the military. We established the Gender Policy Council. And we re-engaged. We rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement on the first day, the World Health Organization. Trump had withdrawn from the World Health Organization during the greatest pandemic in history. This is really unthinkable. We rejoined the New START Treaty. Um, we put our candidacy in for re-election to the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, we did a reset with the International Criminal Court uh, and lifted the sanctions in at Easter time. We began to re-engage re the Iran nuclear deal, which is still going on. And we resumed the process of closing Guantanamo, where there are now only 36 people, 20 ready to transfer. Now, Tony Blinken was the Secretary of State. Uh, a number of us know him. I had written an article in 2003, which he mentioned to me he had read, which argued that our policy should do three simple things, tell the truth, lead by example, and show consistency toward the past, present, and future. And um, again, the game plan followed this pattern. Uh, very early on, Blinken repudiated Mike Pompeo's uh, annual human rights report of the Commission of Unalienable Rights, which was unusually focused on um, uh, uh, reproductive um, uh, battle against abortion and also on the rights of Christians. Um, leading by example, not pretending our history is perfect. And then uh, accountability. 
acknowledging finally the Armenian genocide, the first administration ever to do that, speaking out about <coughs> abuses in Xinjiang, uh, Myanmar, Tigray, Ethiopia, and then eventually Russia's war crimes in Ukraine. And then an effort to build democracy for the future to uh, particularly independence of the judiciary, human rights, and anti-corruption uh, to attack the root causes of human rights abuse. Uh, we went back to the UN Human Rights Council and were re-elected for a three-year term on this platform. And then this area, which David Sheffer and I worked together with uh, in the government, um, the United States did not sign the Rome Treaty in two, 1998, but eventually, before the end of the Clinton administration, signed the Rome Statute. But John Bolton famously unsigned that, and Congress passed the American Service Members Protection Act, sometimes called the Hague Invasion Act. In 2012, we, for the Obama administration, rejected the Bolton position. But in 2017, Bolton, briefly back as National Security Advisor and Pompeo, then the Secretary of State, um, incredibly imposed sanctions on the prosecutor and deputy of the International Criminal Court by executive order. And so we lifted those sanctions and did a reset of the administration's relationship with the new prosecutor of the Assembly of States Parties and the President. It turned out that this was um, prescient because now, of course, all the people who hated the International Criminal Court want the International Criminal Court to prosecute the Russians for their gross violations in Ukraine, forgetting that these are the same people who wanted to impose sanctions on the prosecutor. Among the other things that we did, supporting the ICC's convictions of Aung Wen and Bosco and Taganda, um, building this relationship with the new prosecutor, a British uh, King's Counsel named uh, Kareem Khan, who has opened an investigation into Ukraine going back to 2014, uh, completing the work of the Lebanon Tribunal and then appointing um, Beth von Skak, uh, my former student, but also um, former deputy ambassador at large as the new ambassador at large for global criminal justice. Uh, the biggest challenge, though, was reconceptualize because it became clear that the real challenges were no longer counterterrorism of the 9-11 kind, but global health and climate change. But the bureaucracy was so entrenched on counterterrorism um, that I would go to meetings where they would be talking about how some guy in Africa posed a threat, and we should be devoting a huge amount of resources to tracking him. And I would finally say, excuse me, um, last week 2,000 people died in the United States of the impacts of climate change. 5,000 people died from COVID. On January 6th, a mob of domestic terrorists attacked our capital and tried to kill the Speaker of the House and the Vice President. And your focus, your priority is on some guy in Africa? Can't we revamp our system to get uh, the priorities where they ought to be. The fact of the matter, though, is that it was as if one muscle of someone's arm had been getting steroids for 20 years. And the meetings that I used to attend as the only representative of the State Department, there would be 20 people there speaking for the counterterrorism interest. And the Defense Department and Intel guys had resources that the State Department could barely imagine did you know that at this moment, there are more members of marching bands for the Defense Department than the entire US Foreign Service? <laughs> Which is why kinetic solutions are favored over diplomatic solutions. Now, uh, Biden, with regard to public health, took this on at last year's UN General Assembly, a simple plan, slave lives now, vaccinate the world, build back better. He re-engaged with the WHO, which we had rejoined re and partnered with COVAX, the UN vaccine facility to deliver life-saving vaccines, tried to leverage it into a powerful uh, COVID response and translate to new legal rules on global health. 
Uh, everybody wants the pandemic to be over, but as you know, it's still with us. Um, 6.6 .6 million dead, 628 uh, million cases. To fix the global health architecture, we proposed in a joint op-ed by Secretary uh, Blinken and Xavier uh, Becerra, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, a two-part strategy. First, what we call fix the leaky boat, targeted amendments to the international health regulation so that the problems that led to the pandemic from um, Wuhan don't replicate themselves, and on the second track, build a new pandemic agreement. And this is being drafted, as I speak, by an intergovernmental negotiating body with a focus on multi-sectoral approaches to disease spread from animals to humans, so-called One Health, and access and benefit sharing uh, with regard to uh, exchange of pathogens. Climate security, five million deaths in the world annually and rising. One in three Americans have suffered a severe weather disaster. Two in three have suffered dangerous heat waves. And so Biden made the ambitious pledge, reduce U.S. emissions by 50% by 2030, create 100% carbon pollution-free power sector in 2035, net zero carbon economy by 2050. And the goal is, as we move along, to head to uh, a so-called 1.5 degree uh, temperature rise. In fact, we are heading to a 2.8 degree temperature rise with current pledges. Uh, you may not see it, but that's um, fish species go extinct locally, <coughs> extreme heat waves, drought, species extinction. Species extinction is where we're headed. Um, the goal at Paris in the subsequent meetings was to keep 1.5 alive, which would still lead to a sea level rise of 48 centimeters. The question is, can we achieve this with uh, Ukraine inflation, political turmoil, and the like? Uh, I saw this up close because my son, uh, William, um, went to public health school at Harvard, and part of his project was to go to the Pacific island of Kiribati, uh, which is eight-hour flight from Australia. While he was there, three islands sank into the ocean, um, and the whole of Kiribati will be gone within 10 years. Uh, you see what it looks like now. Um, more than that, what people had not gauged is that there used to be a um, uh, coral reef, there used to be fish, and so people used to eat fish. They're gone. So they're importing food, processed food from Australia. The main things that they're eating are Coca-Cola and Spam, and their public health indicators have gone completely haywire. And the life expectancy of people has dropped by 15 years as a result of this change. Now, obviously countries, the low-lying islands like Kiribati and others are interested in what is called loss and damage. Uh, the top 20 countries in the world have done 80% of the damage in pollution and they want them to pay. Now, John Kerry, our uh, ambassador, special envoy for climate, um, has done an extraordinary job. He's in Mexico today at Glasgow a year ago, they reached uh, five pledges, a methane pledge, because methane is probably the biggest problem we have right now, and deforestation. They wanted to phase out coal, but it's become a coal phase down pledge, and subsidies for overseas fossil fuels, and then persistent meetings with the Chinese um, to reiterate the Paris goal. Although it's a combination of China and Joe Manchin that led to the pledge being a phase down pledge, not a phase out pledge. And China will only start to fall in 2031. Now of the 196 countries in the world, 177 have not yet pledged for the next Paris meeting, which starts on November 7th in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Meanwhile, the United States was nowhere near achieving its goals. But then the first infrastructure bill finally gave 
uh, a total of about 270 billion for clean energy. The second bill looked dead in the water until finally Manchin, at the very last minute, agreed to the Inflation Reduction Act, which is now the most important climate bill in US history. Um, it will cut emissions if it's carried through by 44% by the end of the decade and get us two thirds to 80% of the way toward our goals by 2030. But for this, we would not even be close. And at the same time, the Supreme Court struck down the EPA's power to regulate climate issues in a case called West Virginia versus EPA. So the United States has a challenge meeting its goals and whether other countries can up their pledges will be the challenge that we see at the 27th Conference of Parties in Egypt in two weeks. Uh, the conference runs from November 6th to November 18th. Which brings me to Act 3. Um, three basic questions. Has the United States started pulling its punches on human rights? Is uh, the Afghan withdrawal uh, uh, a failure? And then what about their efforts to reverse Trump immigration policies at the border without legislation. Uh, well, you've all seen that Biden's engagement strategy has led for him to engage with human rights violators uh, if they are potential sources of oil. And as you saw in the New York Times yesterday, a disastrous effort to cut a deal with Mohammed bin Salman um, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and as a result, um, the Saudis have uh, agreed to cut production with the Russians, uh, which will impose severe um, inflation and uh, crisis, which Biden is addressing by uh, dumping uh, uh, huge amounts of the strategic petroleum reserve to try to keep our price of gasoline below $5 a gallon. If you read Tom Friedman's columns in the last few days, he basically points out that Trump, I'm sorry, that Putin could use an energy bomb, namely um, calling a, a lot of issues to account to really put the pressure on the Germans and to try to crack the coalition between the United States and um, the Euro Europe on these issues. But particularly with regard to Saudi and Venezuela, uh, the U.S. human rights uh, zeal has been moderated. There's the famous uh, fist bump of uh, Biden in Jeddah with Mohammed bin Salman, which was done, we learned, because of the thought that they were actually going to keep their part of the bargain with regard to oil, which they have not done. Um, Afghanistan was probably my worst time in five decades on and off in the U.S. government. It was ugly, but I think in retrospect, necessary. In large part, because I don't see how we could be doing what we're doing in Ukraine now if we were also in Afghanistan. In Biden's defense, um, when he came in, Trump had already announced he was leaving. And so all Biden could do was say, let's leave on September 11th. And then they ended up leaving on August 11th. Um, and the United States wasn't ready. Um, I mean, nobody's ready to leave a month before you say you're going to leave. But there are uh, three things that I think have not been properly emphasized. Uh, the Biden administration has been properly criticized for its weak consultation with our closest allies. But three reasons for that were, one, um, Ashraf Ghani, the leader of Afghanistan, begged Biden not to say that the United States was leaving. And so he didn't acknowledge it. And it turned out Ashraf Ghani was planning to leave, and he fled. Uh, so Biden essentially uh, deferred to someone who was um, breaking his own promises. Secondly, military intelligence, and I attended such meetings, wildly uh, underestimated the strength of the Taliban. They kept telling us, we have 90 days, we have 90 days. Meanwhile, the Taliban are sweeping across provincial capitals. Nobody wanted to be the last person to die for a government that wasn't going to stand and fight for itself. And then finally, what about the Afghan 
refugees, which has been a source of continuing problems, particularly those who were interpreters for the US government or otherwise served the military over the course of 20 years, Congress had passed a absurd 14-step process because they did not want anyone in Afghanistan who had relationships with the Taliban to come into the United States. Well, I'm sorry, after 20 years, everybody has relationships with the Taliban. And in a 14-step process, nobody's at step 13. And as a result, because this was mandated by law, this is Congress's doing, the Biden people had to move most of the people who were getting on chaotically in scenes like Vietnam um, to so-called lily pads outside the United States in places like Doha and Kosovo. And um, they're still there. Um, and um, it was a horrible time to be in the government. Everybody was calling you, begging for their family members to get out, et cetera. Finally, the southern border, uh, which I think has been a unique disaster, largely because um, in the middle of all the Afghan crisis, the administration didn't know how to humanely address asylum rights of migrants from uh, the Northern Triangle countries, including um, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, but also transversing through Mexico and people from Haiti. And when 10,000 Haitians were suddenly discovered under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas, they rounded them up with uh, horseback, guys on horseback, um, and then they just sent them back, citing as authority Title 42 the public health authorities uh, of um, uh, the Center for Disease Control. Now, this was just as I was leaving the government. I, I just thought it was blatantly illegal. And I wrote a memo saying it's blatantly illegal. You, you can't do this. Um, it wasn't uh, a resignation letter. Um, I'm still a consultant to the government, but I did uh, send it to many people and the net result was it was leaked and it's described in The Guardian, et cetera. Um, amazingly, the DC Circuit, US Court of Appeals adopted the view I had expressed and said it's illegal. <laughs> and Biden initially, Biden's people initially said, okay, we will comply and change the policy because they had criticized it when it was being done by Trump. But then a very uh, extreme judge in L Louisiana uh, blocked it, and so the policy goes on. The Remain in Mexico policy, uh, which the administration had criticized, also finally was withdrawn, and amazingly, the Roberts Court upheld it. This is all reminiscent of something I argued in an article in 1994. I called it the Haiti paradigm in U.S. human rights policy. Large states fail to address root causes, human rights abuses proliferate, refugees flee, but then we respond to the symptom, the refugees, and not to the underlying problem. When human rights advocates sue, the courts hold for the president, and the result is that human rights policy goes upside down. Uh, we end up with a policy that's anti-refugee and tolerant of human rights abuse, which is where things stand right now with regard to the southern border. Now, Biden's biggest challenge is restoring the liberal international order, which was based on Immanuel Kant's notion of a League of Nations sharing common values. This Kantian system of governance had created uh, the system which tackled most of the problems of the post-war world. But it's been under attack by authoritarians everywhere, not just Trump, but Xi Jinping, Duterte, Maduro, um, uh, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, um, uh, and Vladimir Putin. They have the same, also I should add to this, the woman just elected in Italy. They attack courts in the law, they reject diversity and inclusion, they demonize immigrants, they cow legislators, they disparage bureaucrats, they attack the media, they reward their cronies. And then they talk about a populist constitution where checks and balances give way to the will of the people. What we see is that the emerging alternative 
of these authoritarians to the Kantian global order is a big brother world where we have different spheres of influence, we have fake news, and where the leaders can change their affiliation. One day they love this dictator and the other day they love this dictator. Um, I was struck by this because when Trump went to North Korea, he said, I'm in love with Kim Jong-un. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm from uh, Korea. He is the worst human rights abuser or among them on the planet. And by the way, why would you ever, ever give him a meeting with the President of the United States? I went to uh, Pyongyang with Madeleine Albright in 2000, and the basic rule was unless there are major concessions by the North Koreans with regard to human rights, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, denuclearization, you will never let some tin pot dictator meet with the president and get the value of that. Now, not only did Trump not understand this, I mean, one of the most pathetic things was before Trump went, Kim Jong-un arrested 20 people. And then when he arrived, they, he released them. And Trump said, that was because of me. <laughs> They're also arrested because of you, um, if you were paying attention, which you were not. And it turns out that among the documents at Mar-a-Lago that are most highly classified are his personal letters from Kim Jong-un, which he's claiming are subject to executive privilege, but they're also claiming are his documents, even though he's not the executive. I mean, this is an astonishing state of affairs about which we could say more in Q&A. Now, Biden decided to uh, announce a two-pronged system, invest in diplomatic alliances, and show that democracy delivers as a way of addressing this problem of global democracy. And Blinken has essentially asserted the exact same vision in announcing the general strategy toward China going forward, invest, align, and compete. And so Biden's grand strategy is to try to rebuild the Kantian vision through a series of democracy summits, the second to be held in December. But you should think of the Ukraine crisis as a proof of concept for Biden's overall strategy. This brings us to the last act of the drama, and then I'll stop. This is Ukraine, as you all know. Um, for those of you who haven't followed that closely, in 2013, there was a big demonstration at the Maidan, which is their main square, a revolution of dignity favoring continued European integration. Many were killed. The president fled the country. A pro-European became president, and Obama's Vice President Biden strongly supported the revolution. In fact, Biden has gone to Ukraine at least a dozen times and is very close with the leaders, which is one reason he knows this issue intimately. And as you know, in 2014, the Russians annexed Crimea, which is um, here, uh, the major port, particularly Sevastopol, and they launched uh, an attack by using so-called little green men not wearing uniforms in the Donbas, Luhansk, and uh, Donetsk. And the Ukrainians fought back, and many died. I was in uh, Ukraine. These are everywhere, the martyrs of Maidan and the Donbas. If you walk down the street in Kyiv, they have uh, pictures of all of the guys who died fighting in the Donbas. But the point to take away is this, is this is why the Ukrainians have done so well in the field. They have been fighting the Russians since 2014. They know their weaknesses. And it turns out the Ukrainians are very, very good fighters. It also turns out that there is a resistance in Crimea, like the French resistance. And that group has done a series of attacks and explosions, including most recently at the Kerch Strait Bridge which blocks the Sea of Azov. Now, the Russians made an amazing claim. In 2014, this says, on March 16th, we choose between the Russians or Nazis. 
equating the Ukrainians to Nazis. Yesterday's New York Times points out, and this goes along with the dirty bomb claim, that Russia is now shifting to calling them terrorists rather than Nazis. Uh, and then in 2014, the famous shootdown of the Malaysian airliner over eastern Ukraine, killing nearly 300 people, including four infants. Among the many other violations, look at this picture. This is, um, they've completely violated all of Ukraine's rights in the sea, oil and gas, fisheries. They've polluted the environment. They built this bridge, which is an outrageous environmental disaster. This is the one that was bombed. And here's a picture of Putin coming up from a bathyscaphe, having just seized cultural property and marine archaeology and bragging about it. Now, in the middle of all this is elected this guy who nobody knew. If you go on Netflix, you can watch his TV show, The Servant of the People. It, it's a little weird, but it's kind of funny. It's, it's a story of, about a history professor who becomes president. I'm not kidding. This is like Jerry Seinfeld becoming <laughs> president of the United States. But it turns out he's a media genius. Not only is he quite courageous, He's very media savvy. He won Dancing with the Stars. He and his wife, also brilliantly telegenic, post videos of their workouts on Instagram. He beat Poroshenko by 73% of the vote. And he is the first Jewish president of Ukraine, which makes it quite unlikely that he is actually a neo-Nazi. <laughs> now, uh, we were charged, a group of us, to develop a legal strategy to fight uh, Russian aggression. And uh, our sh basic strategy was simple. Putin's short game is force, our long game is law. Um, we'll get as much information out as possible. We isolate Putin by making him an isolated outlaw in an interdependent world. We increase that isolation by branding as many of his activities and those of his underlings and oligarchs as illegal. We try to provoke a diplomatic process like the Dayton Peace Accords, preserving all along criminal and civil accountability as was done at Dayton itself. And so on the day that Biden left office, we called him and said, we'd like to file these two cases, a uh, case under the law of the sea about the maritime resources and the case challenging the shoot down and the terrorism in eastern Ukraine and Crimea. He gave his go ahead and we filed. So we won uh, the first two stages of that case in 2019. In our last meeting before 2021, I asked the Ukrainian foreign ministry, what will you do if the Russians invade you? And they said, we hope that doesn't happen. And I said, yeah, I know, but what will you do? And they said, uh, I think we should fight them with law. Do you have a suggestion? So we developed the suggestion. And then the Russians invaded. And then I got a call um, from my clients. Here we are in the Carpathian Mountains in a mountain lodge, 26 hours of driving. Kiev is being bombed. Um, we have with us the hard drives of all the computers in the legal department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. What can we do? And we said, well, we propose that you file this case. And they said, okay. Now, oh. when the war began, there were actually three wars. First, the Kinetic War. Putin tried for shock and awe failed, and then settled in for a war in the East and Crimea and at the ports. Um, he tried a strategy of indiscriminate shelling and close-up brutality, drafting conscripts and threatening both the use of nuclear weapons and dirty bombs. It was combined, and I'm happy to say more about this in the um, Q&A, a cyber attack on 48 Ukrainian entities with wiper malware. And Russia positioned false narratives along with false code uh, to try to persuade Russians to back Putin. 
and also discourage the Ukrainians and divide the West and non-aligned countries. Meanwhile, Ukraine has relied on detect, defend, disrupt, and deter, the four Ds, and largely by spreading its digital assets among cloud servers across Europe, have blocked most of these initiatives, aided, in fact, by Elon Musk's Starlink satellite. And the private allies, like Microsoft, have used artificial intelligence to detect breaches by malware and to install corrective patches to prevent the wiper malware from taking effect. And then our legal strategy. Our team suggested two cases before the ICJ, three before the Law of the Sea Tribunals, five before the European Convention on Human Rights, initiating a preliminary investigation into International Criminal Court, a World Trade Organization case, and then a series of international commercial arbitrations. And the argument that we had made was, if Putin is going to say Ukrainians are committing genocide, that's a factual dispute. And if he's saying that that gives them the right to put troops into Ukraine, that's a legal dispute. And that dispute gives us jurisdiction to get into the International Court of Justice. On his disputes, on his lies, we found jurisdiction. So I was at Oxford at the time. This is my daughter, Emily. And we decided we better go to The Hague. We didn't know what was going to happen. We got there. Everybody was supporting uh, the Ukrainians. This is the day before the argument. Here we are in a COVID courtroom. And as you see, Russia didn't show up. So the Russian side of the ledger is all empty. You also see that the judges, four of them were not there because they were in a COVID courtroom. I gave the closing. And the challenge is you have to thread a needle. So I started by saying, when something like this happens, a permanent member of the Security Council commits naked aggression, are you powerless to stop it? Their answer has to be no. If they're powerless to stop it, why bother to sit on this court? And then say, if this court does not act decisively, why should any P5 UN member see international law as an obstacle to necessary military action? Why wouldn't we all be forced to concede that the post-war international legal project has failed? And that we've all been wasting our lives claiming that there is an international law. But then, as you know, when you appear before a judge, after putting the big challenge forward, you dial it back. You don't have to do everything. You must do it quickly. The world awaits your actions. Well, just nine days later, we got a 13 to 2 order ordering Russia to suspend its operations in Ukraine, and unanimous order. Even the Russian and Chinese judge agreed, saying, they can't aggravate or extend the dispute by more severe weapons. This was a huge victory. But the reaction in the West was, I got a call from the Washington Post, um, the world court can't enforce its own judgments. And I said, excuse me, no court anywhere in the world can enforce its own judgments. As we said in Marbury versus Madison, it's the job, province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. They have just said what's going on is illegal. That strips any veneer of legality from Putin's actions. And now everyone can enforce. And the ruling brands Putin an outlaw, isolates him, strengthens the case for more sanctions and more accountability. This has led to three primary spheres of activity. We're still at the ICJ in both cases. As, we're, as Russia has dialed back to Crimea and the Donbass, our second case, or the original case, remains even more relevant. An effort to try to achieve civil compensation, which is ongoing, and then criminal accountability, both for uh, atrocity crimes and a special aggression tribunal. And my friend David Sheffer has written two very interesting articles I re refer to you in the influential blog, Just Security, about what a special aggression tribunal would look like. The road to enforcement is essentially looking for an accelerated Dayton by arguing that the Security Council must bar Russia from voting under Article 27.3 
a UN General Assembly resolution keeping the Chinese neutral. And interestingly, we learned that Biden had quoted our ruling to the Chinese as soon as they met to say, if you give resources to the Russians, you're violating this international court order. All with the goal of isolating and sanctioning Putin and his cronies and making them like Pinochet. Uh, in Ukraine, this is a road sign, all roads lead to The Hague. Um, <laughs> we're essentially trying to use the blueprint of Slobodan Milosevic and Radovan Karadzic, gather an archive of evidence, build prosecution capacity, and address some of the issues. Uh, there's been an effort to create a global focal point for evidence gathering, particularly the department, I'm sorry, the Director of National Intelligence and the U.S. Embassy in The Hague, as well as a series of NGOs and digital crowdsourcing. This is from Yale. One of our public health schools tapped into a satellite and found this filtration camp. So what we're seeing is a campaign of naked aggression and atrocity in service of annexation for which uh, superiors are criminally accountable. We're seeing filtration camps, environmental crimes at Zaporizhia, cluster munitions, thermal barracks, massive displacement, possibly rising to the level of genocide, plus aggression. And the question now is how to clear the path so that the US government genuinely supports these ICC efforts. Lindsey Graham, who is one of the greatest doubters of the ICC, now trumpets it, and we're trying to get him to put his money where his mouth is by actually supporting legislation by Representative Jason Crow. Merrick Garland, as Attorney General, has sent a war crimes team to assist. So what is the end game? Well, we all wonder that. Um, the calculus has been changed by Ru Ukraine's military victories. Interestingly, Putin said, made positive reference to various peace proposals issued by Ukraine a year ago, where they mentioned not joining NATO, they've since asked to join NATO, security guarantees, non-nuclear status, civil reparations and criminal accountability, prisoner exchange and territorial integrity. But all of this happened right after or right at the same time as he announced referenda in the annexed territories. But you notice that Putin was rebuffed very publicly, both by China and India in this process. Um, so I think my late boss, David and my late boss, Madeleine Albright, got it right. As Bill Clinton famously put it at her funeral, she thought the Ukrainians could prevail if we just stick with them. And I think that's right. So that brings me to the end. Biden is not at the beginning, but he's at the end of the beginning. Um, he's a decent and decisive president. I serve presidents who are not decisive, although they were decent, and I serve presidents who are decisive, but not decent. <laughs> but Biden needs support because his challenges are huge and the alternatives are unthinkable. Is his broader goal of restoring the liberal international order, the thicker version, still possible? Well, let me close with this story. When I went, right after I argued at the ICJ, I was invited to Ukraine by this young woman, Tata Marharian, who was the leading international law student of Ukraine. And she asked me to judge the international law moot court. And she took me around all weekend. I got back on March, 10th, and then the pandemic broke out. The next time I saw her was on CNN. Here she is. And she's been uh, reporting regularly on one particular show. She's working in a military hospital, and she said, where is the law I believed in? She said, I don't know how long I can go with news of friends and my close ones being captured by the Russians, being wounded and dying. In fact, I'm participating in a Zoom birthday party for her next Tuesday to try to keep her spirits up. But what struck me was that I had judged, this is the Yale Law School International Law Moot Court team, I judged them, flew to Kiev, and then judged the Ukrainian team. It was the same case. Students a world apart speaking the language of international law. 
And incredibly, they had 25 years of Ukrainian winners coming back for a reunion. And I asked them, what do you do? Every one of them is suing the Russians in one of these cases. They said, we are your international law army. And ta Tata, Tata posted this, dear Mr. Ko, let us battle a little bit on the ground. We'll be back to the international law army of Ukraine. So this is what Chuck Case spent his life fighting for, the rule of law. That is the mission of this organization, Global Santa Fe. And I think this is what we must collectively keep fighting for as the war on Ukraine in Ukraine wears on to what we hope will be a successful conclusion. I, I'm very grateful to have the chance to come out here to this beautiful place and to talk about these issues of great interest. I'm sorry I went on at some length, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Great. Well, I have a ton of questions for Harold, but I want to let you guys ask. So David Schulman, you're first. Billions of dollars of Russian assets, both private and official, have been seized by Western countries, including the United States, and central bank assets especially. Can those assets be now used by the government of Ukraine instead of sitting there sterile where, no one is, where, where they can't be used immediately? So what are the limitations on taking those assets and turning those assets over today, tomorrow, next month to the Ukrainian government? which is obviously being the, the victim of a sustained aggression. Thank you. That's the 365 billion <laughs> pound question. Um, so it won't surprise you I'm spending a huge amount of time on this issue. Um, so, so here are some basic parameters. Most of the assets are being frozen in Europe. The United States has only $26 billion worth. So we are not the lead player. But you're absolutely right. What everybody wants to make sure is that if and when Putin starts to negotiate, um, that he doesn't suddenly claim, I'm just going to unfreeze these assets and they come back to me because of the damage that he's caused. Uh, one of the values of our International Court of Justice case is from the day the court issues its order, which is March 16th, um, the injury that they're causing in violation of the order is compensation and damages that can be awarded to the Ukrainians. So if the International Court of Justice were to designate a number at the end of the hearing, that number would be owed to the Ukrainians and it would not be presumptively uh, uh, Putin's to reclaim. Um, the other point is that there's a general rule, which I'm sure you know, which is that you're supposed to uh, freeze but not seize assets without the foreign government's consent. But if you have a judgment in a court or an arbitration and the assets have been immobilized, it can be awarded, which is one reason why this lawfare strategy on multiple levels could lead to um, this money actually being turned over. Now, I've been appointed to uh, an advisory panel to President Zelensky about the compensation issue. Um, it would eventually have to go to the UN General Assembly to be announced as a plan, and there are a number of models that are being looked at. You know, one is the Iraqi Kuwait Compensation Commission, where um, they were able to tap uh, oil money uh, from Kuwait and from Iraq that was used to pay off the Kuwaitis after Saddam Hussein invaded in 1990. But there's a real challenge which we face in any kind of compensation system, which is how do you prioritize injury? And um, you know, the obvious top priority for the Ukrainians is to rebuild their essential infrastructure because, you know, their roads, their railroads, um, and most important, their ports. 
So right now, much of the fighting is going on at those ports in the south that are not controlled by the Russians, particularly at Kherson, Odessa, and Mariupol. If Ukraine is going to continue to survive as an independent nation state, it has to be able to sell its grain to Africa. And the fact that they've been having trouble doing so is part of the obstruction um, uh, uh, that, that has been addressed by Secretary General Guterres uh, in negotiating a um, free passage of grain. So um, it's going to be very important for those ports to remain clear, which is one reason why the Russians are fighting for them so hard. Also, you know, everyone's thought is it's very hard for the Ukrainians to give up territory that they fought and bled for. And, um, you know, there could be some kind of standstill. Usually at these uh, negotiation situations, there's a standstill when the fighting stops and the ceasefire begins where everybody maintains control of the property they had at that moment. But President Zelensky doesn't want to surrender Crimea and the Donbass permanently to um, the Russians. So, and then finally, what do you do about all the people who have suffered gross human rights abuse? Where, where, where do they stand in this priority? Um, a lot of the entities who are best able to make a claim are companies who you know, obviously suffered massive commercial injury. But should their claims come before people who have been held in filtration camps? There, there has to be some kind of priority scheme developed. There's also a dilemma about registering claims. Because if you set up a system of registering claims that somebody could like, just go online and file a claim, it, it would vastly exceed, the total of the claims filed would vastly exceed the amount of money frozen. And um, you don't want to create false expectations for people that they're all going to get their money back right away. You know, we, we had the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal was set up in 1980. It's 42 years later, we're still litigating that issue. So um, this is an amazingly difficult issue that I think is going to be with us for a very long time and has to be thought through with great care. Um, I know that the Biden administration is working this issue very, very hard right now and trying to come up with a plan. But the Ukrainians are also trying to come up with a plan. And, and the, the strategy has been nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. And so the Ukrainians have to agree for it to become a negotiable issue. Now, as you may have noticed, a couple of days ago, a group of legislators suddenly said, cut Ukraine out of it and just ne negotiate directly with the Russians. Um, and um, I, I don't know where that came from, but um, as you may have noticed, they walked it back. And, and you know, the Biden administration, I think, said to them, you know, whose interests are you pursuing here? Um, and so, um, but it, it shows, uh, by the way, I, I think the greatest threat we have right now, um, McCarthy and the Republicans have said, if, if we take control of both houses, we're going to cut off aid to, or we're going to vastly reduce aid to Ukraine. Now, if you're Putin, and that's like, what would you do? You would try to influence our election so those guys win. And they have massive cyber resources. Um, and so that's a very disturbing proposition. And, um, you know, we're, we're so we're, we're going to see what happens. We only have, what, 10 days left or something till the election. But it's going to be huge, and it could undermine uh, Biden's efforts. The other thing, obviously, is will the price of oil and inflation um, end up really damaging Biden at the polls and thus making it poss impossible for him to pursue this Ukraine policy? Across Europe, I mean, you know, the, the British economy is in a shambles uh, in good measure because of the issue. But what the conservatives there are not saying is, we destroyed the economy through Brexit. In fact, I mean, I lived in England last year. The destruction by Brexit was largely concealed by the pandemic. 
And now, you know, you had Liz Truss, who served for 44 days as prime minister. Seven of those is during the funeral. <laughs> so <laughs> she was even less successful than you think. And now the question is, will they have some plan? And they're blaming it all on fiscal policies and other kinds of things, uh, government spending, uh, when in fact it, it's a product of a self-inflicted wound. Um, so anyway, I think um, uh, Germany's going to have trouble. Obviously, the Italians, do they even have a policy anymore now? Um, the Brits are in a shambles. What's holding it together is the United States reemerging as a leader on this, and that could fall apart in seven days. So um, this is a real nail-biting time. Carol, we have a question in the back. Way, way in the back there. Yep. First, you are absolutely splendid. I wish I was a student of yours. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> May I ask, what is your theory or uh, what do you think will happen in Russia if somebody could quietly take out Vladimir Putin? I think that's an increasingly likely prospect. And I think the model of this is the exit of Yuri and Dropoff, former KGB leader. Now, you know, the call up of the, the conscripted troops has really opened up the criticism, public criticism of Putin. You know, military leaders are now openly saying that Putin, I mean, th this was all Putin's call. Uh, it's not as if there was a big push within Russia to invade. Arguably, they had control of Crimea, and uh, they were fighting the Donbass anyway. Why did they need to invade? Um, but I don't know if you saw this absolutely chilling story in the New York Times. There are no adult males in Moscow. They've all been drafted um, or left. But the ones who left, if they're driving, I was told by someone, if you f try to fly to Istanbul, it costs uh, something like 15,000 euro. And if you get to the airport, you could be drafted. And if you're in a car and you're trying to go across the border through some border checkpoint, and there's a man in the car, he'll be drafted. Um, so, um, I think that the chance of Putin being uh, pushed out, assassinated, poisoned, uh, disappeared are pretty significant. The other thing, and this is just my own pet theory of the case um, that I've been thinking about is, um, you know, Putin is a KGB case officer. Did he not have an exit strategy before he launched the invasion? Um, could he have moved assets to, say, Saudi Arabia and uh, have a place to live there, some dacha in the desert, uh, where if the going gets tough, he's gone the next day? And um, it's interesting because um, I'll never forget that when I was working for Secretary Albright, we, we met in the Waldorf Astoria in New York with Alberto Fujimori, the leader of, of, of Peru. And no one could have looked more self-confident or cocky. And he, we were told, Fujimori doesn't speak English. And he comes in and he conducts the entire meeting in perfect English, which was a complete shocker. And then he says, I'm going to be here for a long, long time. Those are his last words. Three days later, he fled to Tokyo. <laughs> so um, when these guys go down, they go down very fast. And by the way, that includes Donald Trump. Um, so uh, you know, the, they look like they're in charge of a lot of things, and then it all crumbles. So, um, and, and by the way, the, the oligarchs uh, who were being served and were serving Putin 
are now suffering because of his actions. You know, they, they've lost their yachts, they've lost their soccer teams, they've lost their assets in London, and um, they, you know, at this point, a lot of people must be thinking, shouldn't we? Can't we get a better way to go on this for the future? So, um, unfortunately, I do not think it means that a Democrat like Navalny is going to come in. I think it means that another more competent dictator like Putin will take over from Putin. Uh, but you know, I, I think we're getting very close to that point in time. We have a question from the gentleman in the green checked shirt. Okay, this is a, a legal question. When is genocide genocide? And how do we, I mean, you could apply that to Palestine, you could apply it to Ukraine, you could apply it to numerous places. Well, uh, I'd let Dave Shepard take that one, but you know, we, as we well know, it's um, a series of acts, including killing people, but done with a particular specific genocidal intent, which is an intent to destroy a group, uh, an ethnic, religious, or uh, other group. Uh, the problem is always establishing the intent because um, they have to be trying to destroy a group in whole or in part. Um, which is why it's hard to make the case that the Russians are engaging in genocide because you don't have that smoking gun of what people have said. Um, you know, for example, it's pretty clear that the, the, the one, one reason I'm very passionate about this is that um, my parents grew up in Korea under Japanese colonial rule. And a feature of that era was they were not allowed to speak Korean. They were not allowed to invoke any Korean cultural traditions, and that they, in fact, were required to use Japanese names and act like they're Japanese. Um, and uh, my father told me this chilling story that, that he would come to school as a young boy, and they would be given 10 matches. And if someone spoke Korean, you could, a word of Korean, you could demand the match from them. And you'd have to give it to them if you were the person who was speaking Korean. And at the end of the day, they would count who had the most matches, and that person was rewarded. And you'd count who had the least matches, and that person was savagely beaten. And it was all a way of erasing Korean culture. Well, it didn't work. But that's essentially what's going on in Ukraine, but particularly in Crimea. And uh, the irony, of course, is that Putin has made the opposite claim that Ukrainians are committing genocide. This is really, there's absolutely no basis for this whatsoever. But one reason why everybody's worried about the dirty bomb allegation is that Putin and the Russians seem to like to put into play some idea and then try to sell to the Russian people that it's, that's what the Ukrainians are doing. So we could see a dirty bomb that comes from the Russians, but is blamed on the Ukrainians. And, and that's a very frightening uh, prospect. Um, finally, um, I talked a little bit about the Russian uh, disinformation strategy. Uh, their basic strategy is propaganda on television. I mean, Russia is not dissimilar to the United States. You know, people over the age of 60 watch 60 minutes <laughs> or television news shows and nobody else does. So that's where they've been broadcasting their message uh, about um, Ukrainian failures. But young people on social media are all completely aware of the disastrous defeats the Russians are suffering, which is one reason why they're so restless about it. Um, and uh, you know, this is sort of what happened during the Vietnam War too. You know, if, if you are the person who's about to get drafted next, um, you know, you don't want to be the last person to die in Putin's um, misbegotten war. And um, uh, the level of unrest is at an extremely high level now. So, and we're heading into the winter. Um, so we'll see which side cracks. We have time for one more question. Yeah, they're bringing it to me. Um, where does international law stand? The uh, chief of state is indicted at the Hague, and he 
he or she be seized outside their uh, outside their na their nation state? Yes, it would obviously it would depend on. So the, the central challenge, which Dave Sheffer has been writing about, is there is no tribunal that has jurisdiction over Putin's aggression, but the International Criminal Court in The Hague does have jurisdiction over his war crimes. So it's possible he could be summoned to, or, or uh, you know, often what happens is that the, the uh, society tr turns him over so that they can turn over a new leaf, you know, as the Serbs turned over Milosevic so that they could make a plausible cl claim for admission to the EU. And that's how Milosevic got to The Hague, got tried. So that's a delicate dance. You want the leader to make the deal that ends the conflict and stops the killing. And then you want to preserve the possibility that they can be held accountable. And Milosevic and uh, Karadzic were both held accountable. Uh, and Karadzic was convicted by the Yugoslav Tribunal. and currently in a um, um, prison in the Hague. But you know, these guys are, <laughs> I, I just have to tell the story. My, my nephew is also an international lawyer and he was a law clerk for the judge on the Karadzic case. And he told me this amazing story that you know, he's in the courtroom every day for three years. And about a, three months in, at the end of the case, Karadzic is leaving. Karadzic, uh, they call him Karadzic, is leaving. And um, one of Steve's colleagues, another young law clerk, goes, Steve, do you want me to um, bring your books with me or something like that? And he s looks over and he sees Karadzic and his, his eyes are, his nostrils like flare, he says. And then the next day, he's sitting at his desk in the courtroom. And who appears before him but Karadzic? And he goes, hello, Steve. How are you? Are things good? And he said, um, it, it was just like Anthony Hopkins and the, <laughs> the silence of the lambs. You know? I mean, th these people are extremely charismatic and charming, which is one reason why they were able to achieve all of these atrocities, because people followed them. And um, so there will be a question, you know, as you may have noticed, Putin seems to be losing his grip on reality. He's a germaphobe. He sits very far away from uh, the people who he's ordering. Uh, his, you know, he sacks his generals who are failing. And um, increasingly, he just looks like a guy who's not in contact with reality. And so the question is, when will that all come home to roost? And, and let's ho hope it comes. You know, there are any number of ways that all of these strands can uh, intersect over the next uh, six to six months to a year. But let, let's hope this is one of the more favorable scenarios. Great. Well, we're out of we're out of time for Q and A, but we want to invite Chuck Case up here to say a few words and close us out. Chuck, why don't you sit here? Oh. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Coe, for your wonderfully insightful, sometimes chilling uh, remarks on the status of the world today and particularly international law. We're extremely grateful for you taking the time to come this far uh, to uh, present to this group, and I am personally deeply appreciative of that. And also many thanks to David Killian who had the wisdom to invite you <laughs> and the Global Santa Fe staff for organizing the event. And finally, thanks to the board uh, for creating this lecture in my name. I'm truly honored and humbled. And to family, friends, and colleagues who have contributed financially to the success of this event. Uh, when my wife Pam and I came to Santa Fe eight years ago, 
one of the first things we did was to join Global Santa Fe. At the time, I had no idea that the journey that that decision, the, the journey that decision would take me on. And I can say now it was perhaps the most impactful choice I made in those first few months. Uh, Global Santa Fe is truly a wonderful organization. And I thank all of you who are members and urge each of you who is not a member to join. It's not hard. All you gotta do is go to the website and click join. <laughs> because members are the essential beating heart of Global Santa Fe and while we exist for you, we cannot exist without you. Uh, now, let me just give you a couple of thoughts on what else is coming up as you leave today. Next Tuesday evening, Margaret Traub, head of global initiatives of the International Medical Corps, will speak on global humanitarian crises at the Hotel Santa Fe. And in the week of November 13th, we are launching our Democracy Under Fire series with two events with the historian Jeremy Suri. November 13th, uh, he wrote a book, Civil War by uh, Other Means, America's Long and Unfinished Fight for Democracy, and that will be at Collected Works, one of our local partners, uh, where we, we often uh, partner with uh, Dorothy Massey. And it's, uh, it's been very beneficial to us, and we hope to her, too. And then he will give a talk, a lunch talk, the next day at La Fonda, How Does Domestic Disorder in the U.S. Affect U.S. Foreign Policy? I'm sure that will be very positive, uh, <laughs> as we have seen. Then on November 16th, uh, we will have here in Santa Fe the all-star journalists Peter Baker and Susan Glasser uh, in person at the New Mexico History Museum. And that's preceded by a VIP event at Osteria da Sisi that I'll encourage you all to look at uh, that's located nearby. And while you're looking there at the website, remember, just click join, it's not hard. <laughs> and also sign up, if you're not, for our weekly digest uh, newsletter so you won't miss the terrific programming. Uh, and you can see, Lisa, where are you, Lisa? Lisa is our executive director and our other staff members. I saw Christian, where's Christian? Right here, Christian. There's Christian, and who else do we have here from the staff? Susan is back there. Uh, you can ask any of them questions about how to do this. So, in short, I am deeply gratified by your attendance today. I was uh, thoroughly enchanted by what Professor Coe had to say and about his, his deep knowledge. It turns out uh, we have many friends in common um, that uh, I didn't know about until um, this opportunity came up. So with that, thanks to all, and we're adjourned.